According to Nellie McKay and Henry Louis Gates in the preface to the second edition of the Norton Anthology of African American Literature, in the history of the world's great literatures, few traditions have origins as various as that created by African slaves and ex-slaves writing in the English language from the third quarter of the 18th century moving forward. In the stubbornly durable history of human slavery, it was only the black slaves in England and the United States who created genres of literatures that, at once, testified against their captors and bore witness to the urge to be free and literate, to embrace the European Enlightenment's dream of reason and the American Enlightenment's dream of civil liberty wedded in great writings. That African Americans have developed literatures of any sort in the United States is incredible. From the birth of America's peculiar institution in 1619 to the death of the Great Society in the 1960s, Black Americans have been restricted in their exposure to the written word, the chief mode of acculturation in Euro-American society. The very acts of learning to read and to write protest the delimited status afforded African Americans. Since the earliest days of slavery, black Americans have been systematically excluded from the chief means of the process of becoming American, use of the written word. As Bernard Bell explains in the Afro-American novel and its tradition, in the slave community and Negro community, more power resides in the spoken word and the oral tradition as compares the written tradition. African American oral traditions center on verbal art and folklore, myth, legends, folk tales, spirituals, etc. These oral traditions work to transmit knowledge, enforce social norms, validate social and religious institutions, and to provide a psychological release from the domination of white world viewpoints, African American oral traditions reflect. African American oral traditions reflect the everyday vernacular accounts of the black majority, especially the lower classes, and their legacies of self-awareness and endurance to protest their overdetermined statuses as less than human and to attain full, full humanity in an atmosphere determined to subjugate them. The term vernacular comes from the Latin word vernaculus, born in one's house, native, from verna, a slave born in his master's house, a native, and counts among its meanings the following, one, belonging to, developed in, and spoken or used by the people of a particular place, region, or county, native, indigenous, and two, characteristic of a locality, local. For our purposes, the vernacular refers to literary art that springs from the creative interaction between received or learned traditions, like teachings received by the slave from the master, and that which is locally invented, made in America, like the spirituals. African American vernacular traditions consist of sacred songs, prayers, and sermons, as well as secular work songs, rhymes, blues, jazz, and stories of many kinds. African American vernacular traditions also consist of dances, wordless musical performances, stage shows, and visual art forms of many sorts. African American vernacular oral cultural traditions like the spirituals are one, resistant to, protesting of, white America's ethos and worldview, two, reflective of how African Americans see the world, its history and its meaning, and three, to be considered attempts to humanize an often harsh world and to do so with honesty, toughness, and humor. Moreover, oral vernacular traditions have served as the foundational elements of the written tradition within African American literary traditions, and continues to nurture the written tradition, to comment upon it, and criticize it in a dialectical receptacle relation. For example, 
Song or music is a clearly identifiable residual oral vernacular form in the tradition of African American literatures. Spirituals, hymns, work songs, patriotic songs, abolitionist songs, ragtime, blues, gospel, and jazz all contribute to the thematic and structural concerns of individual literatures within the landscape of African American literatures. Even more, whether used in an organic or ornamental manner by African American literary artists, songs of sorrow and joy invariably retained their authentic purpose of decrying oppression and celebrating the possibilities of the human spirit. Racial oppression prevented the full participation of African Americans within the dominant literate white American culture so that African Americans need for symbols and values had to be filled by their ethnic subcultures, calling for retentions of Africanisms centered on hoodoo, conjuring and magic, dance, field holler, work songs, and folk tales. For many slaves, the struggle to survive racial oppression and slavery led to surface level identification with the master's values and a subservient behavior pattern that exploited the disparity between white ideology and black reality. As W.E.B. Du Bois would suggest, the struggle to survive engendered the development of African-American double consciousness. The development of double consciousness, this two-ness of being, aligned with a plethora of African-American survival strategies that required slaves to display surface-level complicity with white definitions of blackness, such as Tommy, shucking and jiving, and copying a plea to testifying such as Tommy, <clears throat> such as Tommy shucking and jiving and copying a plea to signifying, sounding, playing the dozens, talking trash, and rapping. These symbolic vernacular acts are reflections of what Ralph Ellison calls double vision, the seeing of the world through two sets of eyes. One can discern African American values in these acts acts emanating from a cyclical Judeo-Christian vision of history and of African Americans as a disinherited, innocent, colonized people, a vision that sanctions African American resilience of spirit and pursuit of social justice. A tragic comic vision of life, a tough-minded grip on reality, an extraordinary faith in the redemptive power of suffering and patience, a vigorous zeal for life, a wry sense of humor and an acute sense of timing are black values as transmitted through African American literatures. These values, mainly the product of the resiliency of African cultural survivals and resistance to class, color, and gender domination are the major sources of tension in the themes, characters, and forms of African American literatures. Consider the following. Henry Highland Garnet, Resistance, Bridging the Gap Between High and Low Cultures in African American Protest Literature. In 1843, Henry Highland Garnet delivered an address to the slaves of the United States of America at the National Negro Convention held in Buffalo, New York. The first National Negro Convention was held in Philadelphia in 1831, after more than a decade of organized abolitionism among Northern free blacks, who numbered more than 100,000 in the mid-1800s. The convention's main aims were to address anti-black violence, discrimination, and slavery. Garnett's oration reflects the development of a 19th century black nationalist political consciousness within African American literatures, an ethos of what it means to be black. Moreover, the speech shares many functional similarities with the spirituals and resonates with many of the hallmarks of African American literatures in general. Garnett was born a slave in Maryland in 1815. 
he escaped with his family in 1825. He became actively involved in anti-slavery organizing efforts after being educated as a minister. An address is seminal in that it is one of the earliest pieces of literature by an African American directly directed specifically to enslaved African Americans. It functions to bridge the gap between free black communities and enslaved black communities, between high elite educated black culture and low vernacular black culture. Resonating with themes later developed upon by Malcolm X more than a century later, Garnett calls for the use of any means, including violence, to protest and to overthrow the regime of slavery in America. As literature, an address reflects a developing black nationalist consciousness, itself the result of the intersection of European and American political thought juxtaposed against the lives and experiences of free blacks and enslaved Africans in America. While the speech was first presented in 1843, it, along with a copy of the text of David Walker's Appeal, was published in 1848, a time of great wave-like nationalistic movements throughout the European continent. A quick aside regarding David Walker's appeal. While Du Bois acknowledges that African Americans produced poems, polemical tracts, religious sermons, and historical works by the late 1800s, such generic choices did not reflect the characteristics called for by Du Bois as regards great literature. The African American Jeremiah developed into one such genre. Consider the literary genre most characteristic of the black writing advocated by Du Bois is the African American Jeremiad. The African American Jeremiad acknowledges racism and white supremacy in America. However, it is primarily directed towards blacks and is a self critique of the failure of blacks to take full advantage of their opportunities, blaming blacks for their slothfulness dissipation, parochialism, and reliance on panaceas. Still in all, the African-American Jeremiah functions as a form of internal and external critical analysis as regards those within and those without African-American communities and cultures. For example, David Walker's appeal, the most important Jeremiah example in the 19th century, is a vivid catalog of the many varieties of white and black wretchedness. Just the same, although Walker is the premier 19th century example of the African American Jeremiad, it would be a mistake to limit the black Jeremiad to David Walker alone. The most notable practitioner in recent decades, at least according to Eisenstadt, has been Malcolm X. Malcolm X and the more unabashedly conservative exponents of the genre are in alignment as regards the conviction that black problems can only be solved or hindered by blacks themselves, and that white racism is finally just an irritant that lacks the determinative power to define or circumscribe African Americans as individuals or as a collective. Turning to Garnett's An Address, while the speech was first presented in 1843, along with a copy of the text of David Walker's Appeal, it was published in 1848, a time of great wave-like nationalistic movements throughout the European continent. These movements for national self-determination were best summed up by phrases like liberty or death, or Patrick Henry's famous, give me liberty or give me death. Garnett calls for his audience to harken back more than 200 years to 1619, when the first of our injured race were brought to these shores of America at Jamestown, Virginia, as 20 indentured African servants. In so doing, Garnett signifies on or makes an intertextual connection with 
the horror suffered by Africans in the slave ship's hull during the Middle Passage. Eric Robert Taylor, in his chapter entitled Enslavement, Detention, and the Middle Passage from 2006's If We Must Die, discusses the suffering of Africans on board the slave ship. It is this collective memory of the Middle Passage, this collective trauma, in addition to the contemporary sufferings of three millions plus in bondage on American soul to which Garnett refers when he implores, die free men rather than live to be slaves. Brethren, arise, arise, strike for your lives and liberties. Now, now is the day and the hour. Let every slave throughout the land do this and the days of slavery are numbered. You cannot be more oppressed than you have been. You cannot suffer greater cruelties than you have already. Let your motto be resistance. No oppressed people have ever secured their liberty without resistance. What kind of resistance you had better make, you must decide by the circumstances that surround you trust in the living God. In addressing, that is, writing to, or rhetorically engaging, the three millions plus in bondage, Garnett underscores one of the greatest cruelties practiced within the slave system, the shutting out of God's words and light from the minds of the enslaved. In many cases, Christian slave owners forbade their slaves from reading the Bible. As exemplified by North Carolina's 1831 Act to prevent all persons from teaching slaves to read or write, the use of figures accepted, banning teaching slaves to read and write, knowledge was power and slave masters understood that their social control of the slaves could not be maintained solely through physical coercion. And thus, reading and writing were banned according to virtually all slave codes established in the United States. North Carolina's statute underscores the purpose of such codes. It reads, Whereas the teaching of slaves to read and write has a tendency to excite dissatisfaction in their minds and to produce insurrection and rebellion to the manifest injury of the citizens of this state, therefore, be it enacted by the General Assembly of the State of North Carolina, and it is hereby enacted by the authority of the same, that any free person who shall hereafter teach or attempt to teach any slave within the state to read or write the use of figures accepted or shall give or sell to such slave or slaves any books or pamphlets shall be liable to indictment in any court of record in this state having jurisdiction thereof. And upon conviction shall, at the discretion of the court, if a white man or woman be fined not less than $100, nor more than $200, or imprisoned. And if a free person of color shall be fined, imprisoned, or whipped at the discretion of the court, not exceeding 39 lashes, nor less than 20 lashes. Second, be it further enacted that if any slave shall hereafter teach or attempt to teach any other slave to read or write the use of figures accepted, he or she may be carried before any justice of the peace, and on conviction thereof shall be sentenced to receive 39 lashes on his or her bare back. Third, be it further enacted that the judges of the superior courts and the justices of the county courts shall give this act in charge to the grand juries of their respective counties. North Carolina's statute reflects the attitudes of slave masters like Captain Aud, as captured by Frederick Douglass and explained in 1845's Narrative of the Life. 
Things certainly had changed within the American public sphere as regards the teaching of slaves since the days of those 18 August Souls and Phyllis Wheatley. A rebellion like that of a rebellion the likes of Nat Turner's in 1831 tends to result in such consequences. Still, one has to wonder rhetorically to whom does Garnett refer when he states we write to you. We most affectionately address you. For the most, slaves were prohibited from learning to read and to write by threat of punishment by law. Free blacks who taught slaves to read and to write could find themselves catalyzed through imprisonment or fined or whipped or a combination of all. So, who is the you to whom Garnett refers? Unless slaves were present at the convention, a feat that would make the fight for freedom moot, then Garnett's pronoun use addresses audience members who are not only absent and ambiguous, but for whom reception of the text in the written medium would be a transgression of the law and place them in jeopardy of reprisal by law enforcement authorities. On the other hand, Garnett's use of we seems quite transparent. In addressing the slaves, that is, in writing the slaves, Garnett not only openly transgresses slave codes with respect to teaching with respect to the teaching of slaves, but he literally writes into existence the ethos of an African American persona that is continuously becoming, continuously developing. We will not see such deaf use of pronouns again within African American literatures until James Baldwin. Moreover, Garnett reverses and revises the overdetermined, cursed status of blacks as servants and the children of Ham as outlined in Genesis chapter 9, verse 25. Garnett admits that they, white Americans have cursed you. Still, he acknowledges that it is only public opinion. Even more, Garnett labels those who uphold the system of slavery as God-cursed slaveholders. Whereas in the biblical injunction against the line of Ham, it is Noah who invests Canaan with the curse. In an address, it is God who curses slaveholders. Through the lens of double consciousness, Garnett one-ups the writers of Genesis. While the curse of Ham, that blacks, the children of Ham, will be servants to their brothers eternally, was spewed in anger by the patriarch Noah, Garnett's curse emanates from a God desirous of the liberation of three million enslaved blacks in America. Garnett implores the violent revolution of three million enslaved African Americans in an address. He, he repeats this call on numerous occasions throughout the speech. As a matter of fact, his verbosity as relates to the subject could overwhelm one. Still, Garnett must have been aware of the unlikelihood of such an occurrence on behalf of slaves in 1840s America. Perhaps this is why he ends an address stating, you must decide by the circumstances that surround you. That is, slaves should resist slavery based on how they are influenced to fight slavery as influenced by their everyday experiences within American society, as influenced by their local vernacular experiences. The bleeding captive African slave and her enslaved African American descendants are of an innocent people who must not voluntarily submit to this, that is, slavery, argues, argues Garnett. Garnett advocates using every means to resist slavery, moral, intellectual, physical. Like Denmark Vesey, Nat Turner, Madison Washington, and countless others, Garnett argues that catalyzed African Americans must resist slavery, must resist catalyzation. The Spirituals <laughs>
The call for slaves to resist, particularly in combination with the litany of African and African-American revolutionaries supplied to events the practice of an ethos of resistance, once again calls into a question who the imagined audience for an address may be. Just the same, Garnett's list of revolutionaries exposes the history of resistance to enslavement as practiced by black people. As Roberts points out, while Africans found resistance aboard slave ships difficult and opportunities to resist limited, Africans did resist nonetheless. The three principal methods of resistance included suicide, escape, and insurrection. Suicide was by far the number one means of resisting slavery aboard slave ships. Most tried to starve themselves to death. Once on American plantations, enslaved peoples sought to resist slavery according to the circumstances that surrounded them, such as manipulating the work regime, sabotaging tools and equipment, earning money on the side to buy freedom, escaping to fugitive slave communities, also known as maroon societies, and tending personal gardens. All of these tactics were tangible, temporal in nature, and suggested that there were some outlets to the physical oppression suffered under slavery. If a slave escaped from his or her master's plantation, for example, then there would be little doubt about the slave's desire to resist slavery. Still, according to Karen L. Sanger in Slave Resistance and Rhetorical Self-Definition, Spirituals as Strategy, it was the psychological oppression that was most difficult for slaves to resist. Understood within the American public sphere, and in many cases the private sphere, as three-fifths human, chattel property, and barbaric heathens, slaves sought to challenge and to undermine white supremacist understandings of themselves and conceptions of blackness, and in some cases to facilitate the coordination of black movement through the American landscape. That is, the spirituals were used to organize rebellion and insurrection among slave communities. As Eric Nielsen explains in Go in the Wilderness, Evading the Eyes of Others in the Slave Songs, it is believed that one of the ways Nat Turner summoned fellow conspirators to the woods was through the use of particular songs, like Go in the Wilderness. The spiritual's covert call to the wilderness is widely regarded as part of a broader clarion call for resistance to slavery. Outside of the surveillance of a system that interpreted black people as three-fifths human, chattel property, and barbaric heathens, slaves found the means to address each other, and this very act of addressing should be considered rhetorical. As outlined by Sanger, slaves co-opted through a lens of double consciousness, a strategy used by whites to oppress slaves and to delimit blackness and turned it into a way to oppress, to resist oppression. Through singing, slaves resisted. Interestingly, as pointed out by Mullins, Roberts, Douglas, Du Bois, and now Sanger, Slaves were usually forced to sing to demonstrate complicity with their subordinated and dominated status as chattel. The spirituals were means by which slaves could thwart white messages of black inferiority. Spirituals refer to religious songs sung by African Americans since the earliest days of slavery and first gathered in a book in 1801 by the black church leader Richard Allen. The term spirituals is a bit misleading. For many black slaves and for their offspring, the divisions between secular and sacred were not as definite as the designation spiritual suggests. They were centered on God and the Bible and sung during work time, play time, and rest time 
as well as on Sundays at praise meetings. That the spirituals were sung not just in ritual worship, but throughout the day meant that they served as powerful shields against the values of the slaveholders and their killing definitions of black humanity. For many slaves, the concept of the sacred signified a strong will to incorporate within this world all the elements of the divine. Spirituals should be investigated as regards their African and European sources, the debates over the originality of their forms and verses, their presentation in minstrel shows and other commercial venues, their fundraising importance for 19th and 20th century black schools and for many other reasons, including their uses for generative approaches to African American literatures. The spirituals were dominated by a second person persona and the use of the second person pronoun you. Less frequent was the use of I or the collective pronoun we. Slaves did not want to suggest a collective rebellion to outsiders who might listen. Consider the first stanza or verse of where you were, were consider the first stanza or verse of were you there when they crucified my Lord? Were you there when they crucified my Lord? Were you there when they crucified my Lord? Oh, sometimes it causes me to tremble, tremble, tremble. Were you there when they crucified my Lord? In addition to the peculiar pronoun use, we are privy to the use of repetitions, were you there when they crucified my Lord? Tropes, the martyrdom of innocence, and signifying an intertextual connection with the sanctioned systematic destruction of the living God, considered so integral to African American literatures. The ideal auditor, or the omnipresence of an all-knowing God, was also a prominent feature of spirituals. It was, the order, it was the auditor who the slave sang to in order to arbitrate the slave's innocence in the face of a guilty system of slavery. Consider the role of the ideal auditor, God, and God's are gonna trouble the water. Wade in the water, children. Wade in the water, children. Wade in the water, children. Gods are gonna trouble the water. Generally speaking, spirituals reflect, one, slaves' identification of themselves as members of a strong, valued community in the face of white tactics to divide and conquer blacks. Two, slaves' definitions of themselves as possessors of God-given creativity. Three, slaves value as God's chosen people, and four, slaves' capabilities to affect changes in their own lives. Sanger classifies the function of spirituals along with techniques or any act, however seemingly insignificant, that reduce the worth of slaves to their masters. Slaves could work more slowly than their masters wanted, they could feign sickness, misunderstand directions, cheat, lie, and steal. In all these ways, slaves thwarted the ability of masters to realize the full value of their property. Singing spirituals allowed slaves to protect themselves from reprisals as regards these more explicit physical methods of resistance to slavery like lying, cheating, and murdering, which work to reinforce negative, barbaric stereotypes associated with blackness. In black culture and black consciousness, Afro-American folk thought from slavery to freedom, Lawrence Levine writes, spirituals were the antebellum slaves' most significant musical creation. Utilizing innuendo, metaphor, and, circum and circumlocution, 
The spirituals reflect practices of verbal art widespread throughout Africa. Slaves frequently sang songs about each other that were incomprehensible to white listeners. In their songs, the slaves generally relate what they have received from their masters or mistresses in a very satirical style and manner. Returning to Sanger, her analysis of the rhetorical roles and functions of spirituals uses perspectives developed by Thomas Benson, Edward Black. <clears throat> Returning to Sanger, her analysis of the rhetorical roles and functions of spirituals uses perspectives developed by Thomas Benson, Edwin Black, and Maurice Charline. From Benson, she borrows the concept of the rhetorical being as a becoming. That is, she understands the slave who sings the spiritual to engage in a rhetorical act always in flux. Benson asserts that the rhetorical being seeks to explore how speakers act to construct their identities as well as that of, those, of their listeners. From Black, Sanger borrows the argument that human beings look to one another for clues as regards how to construct oneself, that is, how to be. Moreover, Black would suggest that within a given speaker's rhetorical discourse, one can discern the speaker's notion of an ideal auditor or the creator of approaches to correctness. Lastly, Sanger makes use of Charline's extension of Benson and Black. That is, Charline extends the constitutive rhetoric. That is, Charline extends the constitutive rhetoric. What constitute one, what, that is, Charline extends the constitutive rhetoric, what constitutes one's rhetorical discourse, to include how human beings become the human beings who seek to influence other human beings in certain ways. Taken together, Benson, Black, and Shoreline, at least according to Sanger, invite us to explore the ways in which rhetorical definitions are constructed and communicated by slaves as events in the spirituals. How did slaves maintain a positive sense of identity in the face of daunting attempts by whites to undermine Black personhood? How did slaves make generative uses of the two sources of information about who they, the slaves, could become? One, owners and overseers, and two, themselves, the enslaved people. So, why did slaves sing the spirituals? One reason is because owners and overseers heartily encouraged singing. Another reason is singing allowed slaves to appear to work within the system while effectively resisting it. And a third reason suggests that by singing, the slaves behaved as owners and overseers desired, but also shared perceptions that resisted and refuted white definitions of blackness. That is, the singing of the spirituals reflects African-American double consciousness. Ultimately, Sanger argues that slaves used both the act of singing and the words of spirituals to unify slave communities. The spirituals function to facilitate the creation of a common core among slaves brought to America from all over Africa. We must remember the slave communities in America were not communities of people at first. They could not, they could only become communities by processes of cultural exchange. What the slaves undeniably shared at the outset was their enslavement. All else had to be created by the slaves themselves. The singing style of the spirituals reflects the following characteristics. Call and response, identity formation, 
second person pronoun use, circumlocution, double entendre, and improvisation. Many slaves believed that some slaves were born to sing, some were born to preach, and some were born to discern the signs. Many white Americans agreed that such characteristics set black Americans apart from normative whiteness. When performances of white middle-class patriarchal masculinity would become too constraining and too delimiting for 19th century white Americans, particularly men, they would seek to write themselves as African-American men and women through queer analyses and internalizations of African-American approaches to song, God, and historical worldview as offered via the medium of blackface minstrelsy. Blackface minstrelsy allowed 19th century white Americans to protest over determined conceptions of whiteness. Blackface minstrelsy, black vernacular cultures, spirituals, and white protest of normative whiteness. As Eric Lott explains in Love and Theft, the Blackface Minstrel Show was a variety show in which performers sang, danced, told jokes, and performed comic skits, predominantly in northern cities of the United States like New York from approximately the middle of the 19th century through the first quarter of the 20th century. The action of the show took place on stage configured as a semicircle of four or five or sometimes more white male performers made up with facial blackening. White participants attended the minstrel show to enjoy the sports and pastimes of the sable race of the South. That is, to enjoy white performers attempting to mimic the vernacular culture traditions of Black Americans. The performer in blackface was thought to be the authentic, real representation of a black man or woman as understood by the white American man who portrayed the character on stage and the crowds that applauded the performance. Jim Crow and the Northern Dandy became the most recognizable icons of what Lot terms the genuine, the genuine Negro fun of the 19th and 20th, 20th century American public. Jim Crow monopolized public attention. Even Mark Twain and his mother attended a minstrel show in St. Louis, Missouri, due to the show's wide acclaim regarding the portrayal of authentic nigger life. And while, at least according to Lott, the, minst the minstrel show arose from a white obsession with black male bodies, their real materiality, Ralph Ellison nonetheless suggested, despite their billings as images of reality, these Negroes of fiction were counterfeits. They were projected aspects of an internal symbolic process through which the white American prepared himself emotionally to perform a social role. Lott posits that the minstrel show was an encapsulation of the effective order of things in a society that racially ranked human beings. Just a quick aside regarding Mark Twain. According to Lott in Love and Theft, Twain was first introduced to blackface minstrelsy shows in the early 1840s. After taking in the realism of black life offered by shows in New York, New York and Hannibal, Missouri, Twain was said to eventually arrange an outing for himself and his mother in St. Louis, Missouri sometime in the 1840s. The two either witnessed the Virginia minstrels of the minstrels of New York. The two either witnessed the Virginia minstrels or the minstrels of New York's Mechanics Hall. Lott discusses the situation on pages 30 and 246 through 252 in Love and Theft.
Okay, now back to the minstrel show. The minstrel show was divided into three parts. One, the song section, emphasizing black wit and jupery, the playing of the dozens, sounding or rapping, for example. Two, the oleo, consisting of malapropos... Two, the oleo, consisting of malapropistic stump speeches, usually focused on satirical takes on God and the promised land. And three, the narrative skit. The minstrel performers often attempted to repress through ridicule the real interest in Black vernacular cultural practices they nonetheless portrayed. Minstrelsy's mixed erotic economy of celebration and exploitation of what was considered Black life. From the start, it appeared that a sort of general illicitness was one of organized minstrelsy's main objectives. Advertisements for minstrel shows highlighted objectionable features of Black life, such as the masturbatory fantasy scene. And promised, ah, advertisements for minstrel shows highlighted objectionable features of Black life, such as the masturbation fantasy scene, promised not to be depicted before genteel white audiences. Yet, nonetheless, part of the underlying attraction for the audience. Locke claims that because of the power of the black penis in white American psychic life, the pleasure minstrelsies largely white and male audiences derived from their investment in blackness always carried the threat of castration. The minstrel show depended on, at the very least, black male sexual misdemeanor an unusual set of racial and sexual fantasies foisted upon blacks by whites in 19th century America. Blackface minstrel shows rely first and foremost on the objectification of black characters in comic set pieces, repartee, and physical burlesque. The emphasis was on spectacle, the shows were ingenious in coming up with ways to fetishize the black male body and spectacle. Black bodies were to be looked at, shaped to the demands of desire. Black bodies were screens on which audience fantasy could rest. When feeling too constrained by the demands of normative whiteness and conceptions of middle-class patriarchal masculinity, Blackface minstrelsy provided an outlet for white Americans to perform social roles denied them by America's color-coded schema. 19th century middle-class definitions of manliness contain the following crucial ingredients. Nobility, intelligence, strength, articulateness, loyalty, virtue, rationality, courage, self-control, courtliness, honesty, and physical attractiveness as defined in white Western pe and physical attractiveness as defined in white Western European terms. Blackness provided the inspiration as well as the occasion to define whiteness at a time in the history of America when whiteness was in question particularly for working class white groups like the Irish. Consider the patty rollers of Gone in the Wilderness. The minstrel show functioned to convert blackness into a beloved and reassuring fetish that helped to secure the position of white spectators as superior controlling figures. Blackface minstrelsy was less a sign of white supremacy than a sign of panic, anxiety, terror, and pleasure regarding the conceptions of white and black identity in America. Moreover, minstrelsy was based on a libidinal economy that promised the undoing of white male sexual sanctity. Blackface minstrelsy also attested to the importance accorded certain strategic body zones. Fat lips, gaping mouth, sucks on sugar cane, 
big heels, huge noses, enormous bustles. Here was a view of sexuality, a pornotopia. The show's focus on black body parts is theatrical dream, condensed and displaced fears imagined in the blaze and the show's focus on black body parts is theatrical dream work condensed and displaced fears imagined in the black body that could be neither forgotten nor fully acknowledged. Scholars suggest that whites got satisfaction in supposing that the African American enjoys in ways unavailable to white Americans through erotic food, strange and noisy music such as spirituals or an unremitting sexual appetite. Lott adds that collective white male violence towards black women in minstrelsy not only tamed an evidently too powerful object of interest, that is, black female bodies, but also contributed to a masculinist enforcement of white male power over the black male bodies to whom the women were supposed to have belonged. The beheeled man blinding black women, a recurring theme in the blackface minstrel show, certainly attested to the power of the black penis in American psychic life. Yet it was still puzzling that black women were so often castrated, although women were often allegorical stand-ins for white men whose erotic looking was undone by the black men they portrayed as objects of their gaze. No doubt this racial undoing, this phallic competition and imagined homosexual threat represented the fear underlying the minstrel show. Lott goes on to suggest that this collective white male violence towards black women underscored minstrelsy's need to figure black male sexual power and white male supremacy at one and the same time. Additionally, the cross-dressing by white men dressed as black women afforded the white men to hint at sexual intimacy between themselves as black women and black men, something not afforded when the men performed the social roles of white men in America. Lastly, and yet a most important aspect, spectatorship in the minstrelsy show was bound up with surveillance. Moreover, Laura Mulvey suggests that the pale gaze was paramount regarding the attraction that the show held for its audience members. She describes the pale gaze as a ferocious investment in demystifying and domesticating black power and white fantasy by projecting vulgar black types as spectacular objects of white men's looking. This looking always took place in, re in relation to an objectified and sexualized black body and was, op and was often conjoined to a sense of terror. And so functions, and so functions the blackface minstrelsy show as a form of protest against 19th and early 20th century normative conceptions of white.